weekly podcast that we've been trying to put together in our walk through the book of John. And you might be wondering, where is the other guy that we've had on here? And uh, let me just tell you this. Um, reason 495, why I don't do leg day, is he got injured doing squats the other day. And um, I told him the whole time, so you crazy, bro. Why are you doing that? And, you know, listen, wisdom spoke. And uh, he just didn't listen to wisdom. So I, that's where I'm at right now. He is home. Either way, we're kidding. We were praying for him and uh, getting recovered from that leg injury and back injury that he had experienced from doing squats. And good as him, he did squats. Like, I mean, I look at it, I get hurt. So that's, I mean, he at least attempted it. So it's all good. Um, he'll, he'll maybe one day not be able to fit into skinny jeans, um, but I will gladly fit into skinny jeans because that's just where I'm at. But welcome back. I'm super excited. It's just me today. So hopefully I won't talk your ear off too much. Uh, got some exciting things. Things that I wanted to dive into from the book of John. And again, through this entire journey, our prayer is that you've just been falling in love with Jesus uh, by reading his account through the book of John. And um, we've really honed in on just trying to get you and me to understand that our life um, that we live to God flows from an understanding of what his word says about us in us. And ultimately, our goal is to get it through us. In order for you to be the most fruitful individual that God called, you first need to understand what he's called you. Because in our lives, we have many different things, places, failures, um, circumstances, maybe an upbringing that has labeled you or titled you something that was untrue. It might have been a fact in the moment. There's a fact that I am a weird individual. I am goofy. I am sometimes immature. That is a fact. But goofy, weird, and immature is not my identity. My identity comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And the way that I live my life isn't based on my personality type or the immaturity or maturity or lack thereof, all the things. It's based on what God says about me. Because if he's the creator, he gave us this book as our instruction manual to be able to live through all right. And so we've been reading through the book of John to help you fall in love with Jesus even more, fall in love with the word of God. And my prayer is, is that number one, through um, us giving our heart to Jesus, having the Holy Spirit living in us, will help us open up a lot of the things that God put in that are behind the scenes. If we read it for reading its sake, and we don't try and place ourselves on the timeline of what's happening, then what happens is, is we will miss out on the applicable truths that we find in the Word of God. And I want to take us to an account that is happening in John chapter 6. And we talked about John chapter 6 last week, but this is to the end of John chapter 6. And it, the title of this portion of the chapter 6 is, Many Disciples Desert Jesus. Now, these weren't just people that didn't like Jesus. It says many disciples desert Jesus. These are people that followed him, walked with him until, turn to your neighbor and say, until it got hard. And I've said this multiple different times, and I've learned this over 10 years of ministry, that I, I really don't fully trust somebody. I love somebody, but don't fully trust them until we have first worked through a disagreement. I'm going to say that again. And I want you to find the wisdom in this and not read into, oh, who should I trust and not trust? I'm just giving you a bit of principle because a lot of times we can get burned because we, 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 we give people the benefit of the doubt, which is a good thing, but we give them too much of us. And what happens is, is it causes more detrimental failure on the other side because we find out people change when they get into an argument. And they don't know how to handle an argument. And I'm a proponent for arguments. Like, it is vital and important. I, 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 every one of our staff members, Miranda, our communications director, Sean, our associate pastor, Carrie, our worship and next text director, like, I tr they're tried and true because we have fought many a times. But we fought well. We have worked through difficulty. We have worked through hardships. And so we know we have each other's back. And so it's the same thing my wife and I. Like, we are a proponent. We haven't fought in a while, but we are a proponent of being able to fight, but fight well. Fighting is a good time. Arguing is a good thing. Disagreements are a good thing if they're done well. Many times we don't change until you, we fall off our horse. 
We won't change if someone says, oh, I would really like it if you would do blank. No, we won't really change until someone says, if you don't blank, do blank, until I'm leaving. So a lot of times, really, we need to hear the small voices, but really, in our immaturity, many times we don't change until it's like the last effort, the last thing. And so uh, for me, uh, we really don't know a relationship with somebody until we've had an argument or a disagreement or a misunderstanding. In this scripture is the point to that point where many disciples desert Jesus. And I want to just really quick reach down to see my phone. I just swiped to a different one either way. Because Sean, Tanya, Adirondack Homestead, which is Leon or um, Nicole. What's up, you guys? Hit the share button, like, comment if you have any questions. Super excited about today. So let's dive into Relationship 101, Jesus style. It says this in verse 60. Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. Can anyone accept it? Let me preface. Jesus, when he was teaching, was talking about a spiritual truth, but he was using physical examples. The principle was spiritual, but he was using a physical example. But because they couldn't understand the spiritual truth behind the physical example, they were saying, this is hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? What did Jesus say? He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no part in the kingdom of heaven. That'd be, be like, Jesus, you a bit nuts. What are you saying? I don't get this. You are crazy. Maybe the murmurs that we're hearing about you being demon possessed are true. Maybe he's bipolar. I don't know. They were like, how can anyone accept that? And Jesus was just bougie how he responded. He didn't say, no, that's not what I mean. You don't get, like, I'm, I'm going to explain it. He said, no, 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 verily I say unto you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no part in the kingdom of heaven. He doubled down on a statement that they didn't understand. So the question is, why did Jesus do that? Uh, and we'll answer that later. But what I really want to double down is this. When we follow Christ, this is where I want you to get into. This is for new believers. This is for mature believers just trying to understand your Bible. When we follow Christ, we forfeit. We should. I'm not saying we, we all automatically do. But we should forfeit the need to be understood all the time. Jesus did not need validation from people. He did not need to water down the word that he gave just so everybody understood. No, no, no. Jesus said, this is who I am. Either you trust me and what I say or you don't. That's it. And so when it comes to the word of God, for me, even if I don't get why Jesus wouldn't explain himself, because for us today, we understand what he's talking about based on the prophecies and based on everything else that he said. And I'll say, well, I'm going to give you the interpretation in just a minute when I read. But Jesus never explained it to the disciples, but he was okay with them deserting him. Why? Because he wanted to know how they would respond when they got into a disagreement. He knew. He knew the matter of man's heart that as soon as it got hard, they would desert him. And so instead of him waiting for them to desert him, he just said something difficult that they couldn't understand, and then they stopped following him. You see, you will know your true friendships when you say something that's hard to understand and people stand around you. I'm just going to continue with the word of God do its thing. And it says, how can anyone accept it? Now, verse 61, Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. And so he said to them, does this offend you? Oh, Jesus already knew. Then what will you think if you see the son of man ascend to heaven again? The spirit alone gives life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you don't believe me. Jesus gave us the answer of what he was talking about. He gave them flat out. He didn't just say all oh, the words. When I say you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, he wasn't saying do that physically. He was saying we need to do it spiritually. Everything that Jesus did and what he said in this context was about spiritual gains. Unless we eat his flesh. What is his flesh? The word of God. What was his blood? The grace that he poured out. He was the covering of our sin. And he was telling us that unless you trust my word and digest that and receive my forgiveness because of the shedding of my blood on the cross, he said, you will not have life. It wasn't meaning that you needed to take a bite of Jesus' bicep. 
It didn't mean you had to drink his blood like a cannibalistic witchcraft ritual. It was a time where he said, this is spirit. So in order for you to feed on me, feed on the words that I speak, feed on the life that I give, but they couldn't get it. They couldn't get past what he said. So they were offended. And this is what happened. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, this is why I said, people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away oh, and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and said, are you going to leave too? Then Peter said, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. Oh, this is so powerful. Church, you can do more with less when you know you're united. You can do more. Jesus had a multitude following him and the multitude left and all he had left were his 12 disciples. And in that moment, he knew he could do more with that. Because they knew Jesus carried the words of life. Even if they didn't understand it, he carried the words of life. And so here's the thing. I, I've heard this from Bill Johnson, and he says it with far better authority. He said, when we follow Christ, I said this already, but I'm going to say it again. When we follow Christ, we give up the need to be understood all the time. So when you're willing to give up the need to be understood every time, this is what it does. It gives you the ability to not fight back to criticism. If somebody criticizes you, if somebody doesn't get what you're trying to do, if somebody in your family is like, what are you doing going to that church? Like, why are you following God? This is absolutely crazy. You don't have to have a 30, 40, 50 a, a, a hour long conversation with them about your life to try and justify why you're doing it. It's okay if you're misunderstood. My wife and I, we've gone through multiple different times where people were publicly shaming us, speaking lies about us, but we determined we will not fight back because it's not my battle to fight. It is God's battle to fight. And in the end, those people that publicly shamed us came to us and privately repented to us because we let the battle go to God because we realized that we gave up the right to be understood when we gave our life to Jesus. And that freed us from trying to justify ourselves. It freed us from trying to figure out the situation because we knew our heart was in the right place. And ultimately, in the end, the story is not done with other people coming against us. The story is done when God speaks. And so we decided we were going to let God speak, and he did. And he did multiple miracles to bring reconciliation within those relationships. And there was far more healing that was done. And even though publicly that word was still out there about my wife and I, it didn't matter. We knew the truth. And so here's the thing. If you know the truth, it doesn't matter what lie is spoken over you. And that's what we're going to get in in a little bit later either way. But many people deserted Jesus and Jesus was okay with that. If you come to Christ and you lose friends, you lose family members that are always there, it's okay. Eventually those friends might come. Those friends might like have the light expose their darkness and they come to know Jesus. And that's going to be through you, maybe through somebody else, but it's okay. Because Jesus says this, and I think Luke, where it talks about how if anyone gives up houses or in our context, cars or any relationship, father or mother, he said in this, like for my sake, Jesus said, if you give up all of that for my sake, and he said, I promise you in this world, I will give you a hundredfold back to you in this world. So what we're willing to give up, even our own dignity to the point where uh, like, Multiple times you might think like if we talk about praying in tongues or demon possession or whatever it might be, it might be a little bit weird for some people to understand that when they're new to the faith, but we can't shy away from that or explain testimonies like that because again, we give up that right to be misunderstood. Like if it's the truth that I'm talking about demon possession or abortion is wrong or it's wrong to be homosexual, like God have designed it heterosexual relationship. I'm okay with people misunderstanding and getting offended with me because they were offended with Jesus. And so I'm just going to speak the truth. I'm going to do it in love to say that there's far more because we're going to get into that just here in a minute. And so I just love Christ being willing to give us that example that we don't have to be understood all the time. And it's okay if people walk away from us because there's far more we can do with the 12 than we could have done with the 12,000. 
So I want to move on within our context of the book of John, and I want to move into John chapter 8. There's so much in John chapter 7. Jesus promises living water, all these great things. But I really want to hone in on chapter 8 where Jesus um, is brought uh, by the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders, a woman who is caught in the very act of adultery. And I'm not going to read the whole thing for time's sake. But the whole context of this story is exactly what I was talking about just a moment. Like you speak the truth, there's grace, but then there's also truth. We talked about that in our first um, session where Jesus was filled with grace and truth. We find it in John chapter 1. Jesus gave us the ability to see people when they're sinning and extend grace to them, but still be willing to share the truth with them. Case in point, if somebody is living a homosexual lifestyle or wondering if their identity, even though they're a biological male, if they feel like they're a woman, I will extend grace just like Jesus did to this woman. But I'm also going to extend the truth that said that God's design, and again, it's his design, not our decision. It's his design is that a man and a woman were meant to be in relationship. That's the design, not, 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 not just our desire. It's our design. And so we need to go back to the ultimate design that God gave. And so that's the truth. But I'm going to do that in love, but also tell them, like, I love you where you're at, but then call them into something greater. Because this is what Jesus did. So what happened was Jesus was teaching. Pharisees and Sadducees had a plot. I can guarantee this was a plot just the way that it was set up. Like, how did they know what house to go into to find a woman who was caught in the act of adultery? And where the heck was the guy? Anyway, I guarantee it was one of their guys pawning, and they were trying to set her up. It's just a horrible thing. So again, unrighteousness to the max on the Pharisees and Sadducees' side. But while Jesus was teaching, they brought a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And according to Jewish law, someone who committed adultery deserved to be stoned on the spot. If there's two or three witnesses, there is no, like, those are the act and judgment. That's the gavel falling down. They were, they were supposed to be dragged out and out of the city and stoned to death. And that was a horrible, horrible experience. Now, there's reasons why God put that in the law. We won't get into that today, but it was a horrible experience. And I won't explain it, but it was literally a crowd of people just chucking huge, small rocks until you died of pain. And the crushing that happened was just absolutely horrible. So that was what the law said they needed to do. And so they brought her to Jesus and said, uh, I'll just read it so that way you get this thing. Verse 4 of, of John chapter 8. Teacher, they said, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Verse 6. They were really trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote with his finger on the dust of the road. Verse 7, they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned for throw the first stone. Oh, Jesus was gangsta. He was gangster. He answered with such precise wisdom, with authority. He didn't need to be understood. He used their very same law against him. He didn't try and set them up and go into a theological debate. He basically said, okay, if you want to stone her because of her sin, I want the one who has no sin to throw the first stone. And then he stoops back down and writes in the sand. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. Verse 8, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away. I love the NLT's version. They slipped away. I'm just going to leave right now because they knew they had some sin in their life. I, I just love it when many times Christians they make it almost their life, whether they like or think that it's that's what they're doing or not, they make it their life goal to point at someone else's sin. And Jesus is like, listen, you have what, your finger pointing at your brother's sin and it's just a speck. He said, don't worry about that speck. Worry about the log in your own eye. So he says, when we go around being the law police, we are actually ignoring a deeper area of our heart that God wants us to tap into. Because yes, it's true. Adultery is wrong. It breaks up a family, hurts the children. Yes, murder is wrong. 
it hurts the person, the family, your own conscience who did the murdering. It does it, absolutely. But there's a side of God that he wants us to see in this moment. I said, listen, if you're without sin, sure, go ahead. But you have to be without sin, cast the first stone. Then they slipped away. Beginning with the oldest, the ones who knew, oh, I've got a lifetime of this stuff i got to repent of, until Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. I love it. And this is what Jesus said. And this is where we can step in with truth. He Remember in John chapter 1, it says he was filled with grace and truth. The reason why they put grace first is because grace, every time a sin is committed, grace must be extended first before truth can be admitted. It's like, it is like the introductory element before you can add in the truth. You have to have grace. And I said this, um, I'm going to say it again uh, in two weeks. Uh, like many people need to know that you care before they care to listen to what you have to say. You have grace. got to have grace. Like that truth will never impact that person's heart until that heart is first softened by the grace. And so Jesus says this. After he extended grace, he stood up and again said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did even one of them condemn you? Now, that was smart enough on that point. They knew that they had screwed up in life. They knew. And so they walked away. That was the smartest thing they did that day. No, Lord, she said, verse, verse 11. And then he said, neither do I go and sin no more. Grace, I'm not going to throw the stone because if anybody in that room, in that crowd could have thrown a stone, it would have been Jesus because he had never sinned. So he had the right and he had the authority to begin the execution of that woman because of her sin against her husband and her sin against God. But he decided, no, because I love you, I extend grace. Then once she received that grace from him, once we receive that grace for the sin that we've committed, then there is truth that comes along. Go and sin no more. Jesus says, I forgive you, but stop it. Let something worse come upon you. What happens if you get caught again and I'm not around? Then there is nothing holding you back from you getting stoned. There is things in life that we really screw up because we think God tells us not to do something because he's trying to keep us from having quote unquote fun. He's not telling to keep you from having fun. He's trying to keep you from the danger of what that sin is. Why he says to have sex only in the context of marriage was because it might be pleasurable outside of marriage and doing this and doing this and doing this with whomever that you want, but there's death on the other side of it. It, in, it brings in a soul tie that you have with the person. It brings in comparison when you actually do get married, it brings in a whole lot of different things that were not healthy for us. And that's why God says it's only for marriage between one man and one woman. And it's the design that he gave because it is the proper way to do it, not to keep you from fun, but to invite you into a full life without having to deal with all the extra sin. Because every time we walk in sin, we are adding a little bit more weight to our back and eventually that weight will become too great for you to bear. And you need a savior like Jesus did for this woman to forgive her. But you also need a savior, Jesus, and friends to tell you, listen, it's not good for you anymore. Let's not do that anymore. It's time for you to go and go into a higher calling. It's not calling someone out. I hate that. I hate it. I hate it. It's calling them up. Sean says that all the time. This is what Jesus did for that woman. He called her up up. He didn't call her out. The Pharisees and Sadducees called her out and they were humbled because of Jesus's wisdom and grace. And when Jesus had that inroad to soften her heart, <clears throat> he blessed her and blessed her. How much time do we got? 1240. <sighs> yeah, there's so much more I want to go into. And we can go into the Jesus heals a man born blind in, in, in chapter nine. Uh, chapter nine is really cool. I mean, th listen, I've just given you um, 30 minutes worth of discussion on two instances out of two chapters, not even the full chapter. If we were to go verse by verse and take out of everything, listen, John, in, in one of the parts of the book of John, it talks about if everything that Jesus did was recorded, there wouldn't be a library big enough in the world to contain all the marvelous things that he did. That's my version of that ver verse, but it's exactly what John said. So within your reading, I, my prayer is that you would read between the lines. Put yourself, while you're reading that story in John chapter 8 about the woman caught in the act of adultery, read it from the perspective of the woman. 
read it from the perspective of Jesus, read it from the perspective of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and, and really dive into what it would be like to really be in that place, in that crowd. Like we, we are really good at visualizing things because we have special effects now to help us see things. Like uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm actually going to be um, showing a part of a, a movie and I can't remember the actual name of the movie, but there's an accusation between the devil, which is played by an awesome actor, like just great job depicting what the devil does and this guy praying. And maybe you've seen the TikTok reel. It's on YouTube as well. You can check it out. Um, and so it was just this constant, the devil was coming after this person that was praying. He had just messed up, messed up, messed up. And there was accus accusations saying, God is nothing. You are nothing. How do you think he's ever going to hear you or listen to you when you're in the middle of what you just did? How could you live with yourself? But the guy just keeps on praying. The guy just keeps on crying out. The guy keeps on just reaching out to Jesus. And the minute in the scene, he says, in Jesus' name, there was like this climactic moment where the music, the dramatic screaming was over and it was silent and the camera pans out and the devil was gone. That's how we're to fight. We have the victory in Jesus Christ. The Bible says we are joint heirs in and with Christ. We are seated in heavenly places. We are above and not beneath. We are behind in no good Thing. And so this is where I want us as a people of God to get to. Fall in love with the Bible, believe its truths, and walk in that understanding every single day. And my prayer is that as you do that, you will become more one with God. He's already in you, but you have a greater relationship with him. So when the lies try to creep in that you're not enough, the lies try to creep in that says, oh, you're all doing all the right things, but nothing right is happening to you. You're just a pawn in this game that God is using to humiliate. Those are lies straight from the pit of hell. And the only way for us to expose the lie is to know the truth. John 8, I'm going to go to John 8 again. John 8, I think... 30, do, 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 where it says, in the truth will set you free. Somebody help me out here. Either way, maybe it's not John 8. <clears throat> maybe it's John 8, 32, maybe. I'm just going to embarrass myself now. Yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is. Sorry, I probably just screamed into the mic. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the cool thing. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to read in verse 31 of John chapter 8, and we're going to go from there, and I'm going to really dive in. Um, yeah, it was John 8, 32. I did it right. Woohoo! Uh, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. If you remain faithful to my teaching, he said, you will know the truth, and that truth, the truth, will set you free. Stay faithful to the teachings. How do I stay faithful to his teachings? Know his teachings. How do I know his teachings? Read his teachings. How do I read his teaching? Open up the Bible. Study it. Listen to teachings about the Gospels. Listen to podcasts about it. Fill your brain. Be a learner. Be a student of the Word. Even if you think that I can't read well, you need to break that lie off of you. I don't understand it. Break that lie. Just start walking in it. I can guarantee you LeBron James or Michael Jordan or uh, Kobe Bryant, great basketball players, but they didn't start that way. They worked into where they are today. And had they sat down on oh, their first year of NBA and only played during the games, they would have phased out like many basketball players do, but they were willing to put in the work every single day. And it's the same concept with your reading. If you're not good at reading, if you're not good at understanding, start and continue to read, get back into it and you will grow. It will happen. I promise you. I, I, I literally, it's last thing, beginning of my uh, tenor, tenets, I don't know what to call it, a career in being a minister I had this massive insecurity. I said this a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning because my grandfather was just so good at the word. Like you ask him a question, he knew what answer in scripture he needed in that moment. And I was like, uh, I'm not there. And um, I can guarantee you, I was always insecure about what I said. If I butchered something, it was just absolutely horrible. It just hurt my self-esteem. I didn't think I was there, but I was 20 years old, 22 years old when I started ministering. Now, I'm, and my grandfather at the time was 82. 
Like he, he had had 42 years of being in the Bible. And uh, now me 10 years into ministering, I'm a lot better at my chapter verses helping people because I still said yes every day to diving into the word. And even though I'm still not where my grandfather was in the knowledge and capacity and even anointing and heart for people, I guarantee I will get there and I will surpass it. But it's constantly saying yes when you don't feel you have it in you to say yes. And so that's my final encouragement to you. Walk in the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ every single day. Discipline yourself to getting into the word of God. Read between the lines. Don't add to scripture, but place yourself in the position of the people in scripture and really just thrive in doing that. Listen to messages. How do people hear from the Lord? How do people read the Bible? All of it is great content for you to take in and not just copy what the person does, but take it in, pray and ask the Lord from all of this knowledge that you're gaining from other people's wisdom and from the Holy Spirit, make your own walk. You don't have to copy other people, but allow God to use the examples that people give to create your own testimony and your own journey. So with that being said, that's all I got for you guys today. Um, I just swiped again to the wrong thing here. Tanya, what's up? I love this. Leon, what's up? Joanne, what's up? Bonnie Bonds, how we doing? And everybody else watching this. I love you guys. Thank you so very much for being on here. And I'll see you hopefully with Sean next week to watch out for leg day. And uh, we'll be here again. And uh, we had some technical difficulties, so we started late. But God got us through. Miranda was persistent, got it up and going. And we did it. I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day in Jesus' name.